Yes. Opening video by uh, the trinket, piece trinket by the artist William Popel, whose work was at MOCA this spring. So that was a great way to start our morning. My name is Claire Peeps. I'm the director of the Durfee Foundation. I am delighted to add my welcome to those of you who are in LA. I hope that those of you who've been here for the weekend are finding our town stimulating so far. I know you will in the next couple of days. So uh, we asked you to all come here at eight o'clock this morning. And for you East Coasters, that's almost lunch. But for those of us in the West Coast, it's really early. So, <laughs> so if we're going to start our day early, let's start it with art. The idea in GIA's Idea Labs is to wake us up, in fact, to expand our thinking, to put us in a creative mindset for the rest of our proceedings, and to remind us of why we're all here. We're here because of artists. Artists make art. And we may officially be grant makers in the arts, but I hope and believe that we all at heart are grant makers for artists. We have a really lively format, format this morning. We have three fantastic artists who are going to present for eight minutes each. There are three very different artists working in different formats, and I'm sure their presentations are going to get our juices flowing. And I'm really proud to add that they're all three Angelinos. In fact, we are busting our buttons at the opportunity to showcase some of our talent here. And I just want to mention that thanks to the work of a lot of leaders, uh, Sammy Hoy, who's now at MICA in Baltimore, was at Otis Art Institute and his amazing Creative Economy report, to Keith McNutt from the Actors Fund and his LA Creates report, to Ann Markison, who is with us yesterday for the artists' pre-conference. We know that LA is one of the top three cities in the country in terms of its concentration of artists. And in fact, 9%, more than 9% of all of LA's wage and salary workers are in the creative industries. LA has the highest concentration of art schools in the country. Many people stay here after they've graduated. And thanks to the LA County Arts Commission, to Cultural Affairs, to the Center for Cultural Innovation, and all of the funders who stood up earlier, too numerous to name, we have really built a robust, diverse, and I think resilient arts community. So the artists we're gonna be hearing from move, they're especially adept at moving between, in LA, for-profit, non-profit, and community. And in fact, I think they do that probably better than we funders do most of the time, and I think we have a lot to learn from them. So that's my backdrop. Let's begin, without further ado, our first artist this morning is Alison de la Cruz, and Alison, is a multidisciplinary theater artist, producer, arts educator, facilitator, and cultural organizer. Her original performance work has been presented across the country. She's performed at over 60 colleges and universities and has led trainings at various arts and academic institutions, and recently has been facilitating national dialogues about new work development and how race, culture, and place impact art making and community building in ensemble contexts. Over the last 14 years, De La Cruz has nurtured new artistic voices within queer, immigrant, student, and multicultural communities of LA. In 1999, Pomona College's Asian American Resource Center renamed their highest honor to a graduating senior, the Alice and De La Cruz Outstanding Service to the Asian Pacific Islander Community Award, which is pretty great. She is the new director of the Performing Arts and Community Engagement at the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center. Please let's give it up for Allison. One more second. Okay. Whatever. I'm so excited and nervous. Okay. Mabuhai. Aloha. And welcome to the Archipelago Los Angeles. Can I invite you please to take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Good morning mountains, good morning sea, good morning earth, good morning breeze, good morning freeways, good morning streets. Good morning, forest. Good morning, trees. Good morning, people everywhere. In the basin this morning, 
L.A. Basin, SoCal Basin this morning. Good morning, desert. Good morning, sky. Good morning, feelings. Good morning, ride. Good morning, walk, walk, walk. Good morning, run. Good morning, hustle to and from and from and from. Good morning, ocean. Good morning, islands. Good morning, archipelago. Good morning, basin. We have special guests. They're here from all over to share in our breath. Good morning, strangers. Welcome to LA. Let's breathe together and start our day. May I have you take a breath in and out? Mabuhay, aloha, and again, welcome to the Archipelago Los Angeles. On behalf of my elders and our communities here, I welcome you this morning. My name is Alison De La Cruz, or De La, and my big idea this morning is simply welcome. And where I'm from, we chant or we sing to welcome people. And I wanted to invite you to embrace the sprawl of the LA Basin and just take the second to honor the land and give thanks and love to the Tongva and the Chumash people who first settled here and continue to live here. This land and all of its people are very much and very much informs how I understand myself. It's where I'm from, it's where I stay. I'm a native-born Angelino and a cultural cartographer, part of a Black Lives Matter, Chicano moratorium, Indian Alley, Cooper's Donuts riots, cultural context of multiple named and unnamed history present futures. On behalf of my elders and our Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, South Asian, and Southeast Asian American communities here, we welcome you to our cultural archipelago. Yes, that is A-A-P-I-N-H-S-A-S-E-A-A. And I name it, and I claim it, and I pronounce it to welcome you because we're already here. Growing up here in the basin, I took for granted our diversity, our arts and cultural landscape, and how we created this very specific ecosystem within the LA basin. Know that even in this room, you are now part of our history, because our communities have been throwing fundraisers and parties and conferences and weddings in this hotel, in this room, since at least the 1920s. And so I stand here, and I name that I am descended from artists, administrators, cultural bearers, funders, and people who simply made and make things happen. We are not a monolithic community or model minorities. We are actually somewhere living in this Venn diagram of traditional folk artists, contemporary boundary breakers, administrative visionaries, queer builders, and hybrid makers. We are cultivators, hydrators, crop tenders in neighborhoods that are over 100 years old and some only a few years young, where we have built festivals and gatherings and buildings and theaters and collectives. It's why, uh, and like the, the tides in uh, Archipelago, we have seen the ebb and flow of resources, attention, population, blessings, and challenges. It's why I make work and why I build infrastructure and why I joined our sustainable little Tokyo movement as an artist and a cultural space maker. It's why I invite you to expand your awareness and mindfulness to the Asian American, Pacific Islander, South Asian, Native Hawaiian, Southeast Asian Americans in the communities where you live and work and ultimately fund. And so as I begin to end my portion of the morning, I want to welcome you as the descendants of grant makers of the American past, present, and future, who have helped to shape and nurture and fund this archipelago. And to say thank you, salamat, mahalo. And to share with you my video love letter, to see just some of the elders, peers, and young bloods who were born here, who have visited here, 
who have moved and made home here, and of course to honor those who are no longer here. Many to pay tribute to. Our next fantastic artist is Yuval Sharon. He's the founder and the director of the industry, an LA-based experimental opera company. He's the recipient of the 2014, you have to forgive me because I'm not German, Gotts Friedrich Prize in Germany for his acclaimed production of John Adams' Dr. Atomic, which was originally produced at the Stadttheater Karlsruhe. He's directed multiple productions for the industry as well as a landmark production of John Cage's songbooks at the San Francisco Symphony and Carnegie Hall with Joan LaBarbera, Meredith Monk, and Jesse Norman. Yuval was project director for four years of New York City Opera's Vox, an annual workshop of New American Opera, which became the most important crucible for new opera in the country under his direction, and he was recently appointed a three-year residency at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Yuval. Hello, hi, uh, good morning, and thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, it might be a, a bit of a letdown that I'm not gonna be singing 
for you uh, this morning. Uh, but actually, if you actually heard me sing, uh, you know it's a relief. Um, so, uh, so opera, um, I can't think of a better description of opera than uh, the one that Terry Pratchett, the English author, uh, uh, uses, which says that opera happens because a large number of things fail to go wrong. And um, I do think that's about as good of a description of opera as I can think of, uh, because that large number of things really is that uh, confluence of all of the different arts, that is that definition of opera. It's the meeting place of a composer and a poet and a choreographer and a scenographer and technicians and performing artists, and they all come together in a totally crazy and unstable way to create one vision. And when you start thinking about opera in those terms, in terms of its collaborative aspect, in terms of its multimedia aspect, it no longer is an outdated or old-fashioned art form as some people might think it is. In fact, it suddenly seems incredibly relevant and contemporary. And for me, opera is ultimately an emerging art form. And what I mean by that is that it's an art form that the artists that are developing it and creating it are still discovering what it is and are still figuring out how to articulate what this multimedia mashup could mean for new audiences and for uh, n new geographies, really. Um, that the artwork that we're creating could be responsive, actually, to the environment uh, that it's being built in. So five years ago, uh, I moved out to Los Angeles to start this company called The Industry. And um, the idea is that we would be devoted to the development of these new projects, these new and experimental operas um, that would really explore that multimedia and emergence uh, form um, in exploring new ways of both creating and experiencing the art form. So I believe that it's really going to be um, the boldest and most audacious experiments that not only have the most artistic value, <laughs> personally, uh, but also are going to be the ones that really inspire new audiences. Because usually those things that break the boundary of what you think is possible, that's what, that's what I think we look to the arts to do. We look to the arts to open our vista uh, on uh, what we previously thought was reality and to be able to look at it in a brand new way. And I think opera is particularly well suited to that challenge. Um, so um, the idea also of creating that artwork, but also engaging a new audience for that artwork is really central to, uh, to our mission and to my belief in the, in, in the future of opera. Um, this, later this month, we're premiering a, an opera. It's um, opening October 31st. It's a piece called Hopscotch. It's going to be performing in uh, 24 cars moving throughout Los Angeles. And, um, it's uh, our biggest experiment to date, as you can probably tell, um, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit um, in a second, uh, but I want to give you a background on how we came to this idea and why we're doing these kind of projects. The first opera that we did, uh, large-scale opera we did, was called Crescent City by the composer Anne LeBaron, and this was a project that invited the audience into a warehouse. Uh, six visual artists created a kind of cityscape, and the audience was invited to move freely through this warehouse and see the opera from a number of different vantage points. Um, that's really what began for me an exploration in terms of the relationship of the spectator and the artist uh, and finding new ways to create those kind of relationships. Uh, the next piece that we did was uh, called uh, Invisible Cities in 2013. Uh, this took place in uh, uh, LA's Union Station. And this was a piece in which the live opera was happening among the everyday life of the station, which means we didn't close the station. Uh, uh, businessmen kept eating uh, lunches and dinners uh, at the restaurant there. Uh, people were running to catch their train. All kinds of life was happening, and among that everyday life was this opera happening. Uh, the orchestra was in one building, and the singers were moving freely through the space, and the audience heard the piece through wireless headphones. And I'm gonna play a little bit of the, uh, the trailer for it so you can get a sense of the feeling of it, but um, in the interest of time, I'm also gonna sort of talk over it, uh, <laughs> so I hope you don't mind. Uh, but this was kind of what it felt like. You would be just catching a train and perhaps there's a singer right next to you. Um, there were also dancers moving through the space as well, and they were all coordinated with each other through this wireless headphones. Um, this was a particularly uh, well-received project um, this, uh, Chris Cerrone, the composer of this project, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, the production was um, invited to represent American stage design at the Prague Quadrennial this last year, um, and got an enormous amount of attention. Um, and when you look at these images in this video, um, 
it just looks so seamless and so effortless <laughs> and maybe potentially very inevitable that of course we did an opera in an operating train station. Um, uh, of course, the reality of it was quite the opposite. It was a completely, uh, a com a completely ridiculous concept when I was first describing it to people and very hard for people to wrap their brains around exactly what we were doing. Um, so you guys get the benefit of the final polished uh, image. But while we were doing this, this project seemed so difficult at the time that I, uh, with my collaborators, we said, well, what could be harder than this project? that will make it easy to kind of go on to the next one. So that's when we started saying, you know what would be really hard is an opera that would take place in moving vehicles. Um, and it first was kind of a joke, and we thought, okay, well, uh, that's so ridiculous that now it seems really easy to concentrate back on Union Station, and it's only one location after all, and the audience only stays with their own two feet, um, and uh, they're not necessarily moving uh, in a coordinated way. However, um, the idea of um, the idea of exploring this is the end of the uh, end of the piece looked like this uh, in the in the beautiful old ticket uh, ticket hall. Um, nonetheless, the idea of taking uh, what looks so beautiful from above but can be so horrific from within uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Making that a performative act really started to take on a lot of resonance for us, and um, uh, especially in Los Angeles, because as we all know, uh, uh, driving is so central to the identity of the city for, for better or for worse. Uh, uh, but as soon as we start to explore the identity of the city in this way, we start to explore personal identity, and instantly the piece began to uh, develop uh, in a way that became incredibly rich. And here's exactly how it works. I'm going to show you also a. Uh, this is this is how we built it. This is our thematic map uh, <laughs> of what we wanted the piece to be about. Uh, it was ultimately about finding a center, and this in LA is a very, I think, uh, uh, crucial topic, a city that very infamously has no center. <laughs> How can we make a center in this city? And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we also were inspired by, just to show a, a map of some of our inspirations, like the Guy Debord psycho, uh, psychogeographic map of Paris. Uh, the idea that we disorient the viewer and look at the city in brand new ways, because ultimately there's nothing we take for granted quite as much as the city that we live in. And so the ability to offer new eyes, new ears, and a new way of experiencing the city to our audience was really what inspired us. So here's how this works. You're gonna get into a car. Uh, you'll get, be given one address. Uh, you arrive, there's a car waiting for you. You get in the car and singers and musicians are in the car with you. And for 10 minutes you drive along and you're immersed in one chapter of a story. Uh, you drive for 10 minutes, you get into another car uh, where there are other musicians and uh, another chapter of the story and you get taken to another part of town. And that happens again and again and again. Uh, there are ultimately 24 of these live chapters that happen throughout uh, the uh, geography of LA. Um, it is um, definitely one of the, the craziest things I've ever tried to pull off. <laughs> and you are all catching me in a very interesting moment because we have just finished the dress rehearsal of the third route. It's divided on three geographic routes. Um, and um, we are just about to open the central hub, which is the element that I'm the most excited about. Uh, this is going to be an open to the public pavilion um, that is going to be hosted at SciArc, in which all 24 car rides are live streamed uh, to the public. So taking the isolation of the, uh, of the individual car ride and exploding that and opening it up to as many people as possible. And I... I wish that uh, if we were doing this next year, I could tell you what I've been learning from this project, but I'm still discovering uh, during this project. What I can finally say about it, though, is that it's really, I feel like what we're doing here is creating exactly the kind of work that I think uh, is resonating with this particular city, and that's an incredibly powerful feeling, that the idea that the arts are actually not peripheral, but central to an uh, understanding of a civic identity uh, is something that's incredibly meaningful, and um, I wish that you all could see it. Hopefully, maybe you'll extend your trips and uh, stay uh, through our opening on October 31st. But um, ultimately, that act of offering a new, uh, offering people that new way of listening and looking, is what opera is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Yuval. You all have to come back now. You all have to come back and ride, ride in the cars for all the chapters.
Our final artist this morning is Alexandra Grant. She's an LA-based artist who uses language, literature, and exchanges with writers as the basis for her work in painting, drawing, and sculpture. Grant's work has been exhibited at our Museum of Contemporary Art, or MOCA, and at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA, among other museums and galleries. She's collaborated with artists and writers, including philosopher and playwright Hélène Sicoud, hypertext pioneer Michael Joyce, and actor and writer Keanu Reeves. Grant is also recognized for her philanthropic Grant Love Project, which produces and sells original artworks and additions to benefit artists and arts nonprofits. Please welcome Alexandra. I'm gonna turn this little light off in case there's any accidents. Adjust for the six foot one crowd. Good morning. I am um, really thrilled to be here. It's, it's an honor um, in large part because I'm a, a mini philanthropist and there's nothing, um, I, I don't know, I look out at you and I'm so grateful for the work you do. You don't know how much life you bring to so many members of our community and colleagues. And it has been a huge part of my practice to, to want to be more like you. I know for an artist to say that, you might not be told that every day. So I, um, in 2008, had a crisis. It's a crisis of conscience, um, which was that I was becoming successful as an artist. And I was receiving grants and selling my work. And the more successful I became, the less prepared I was for it. And I also became distanced from the very reason, the ethical reasons that I set out to be an artist, which were to be philanthropic, and I mean that in the biggest sense, to love people. And the more successful, the more isolated, the fancier the parties got, the champagne is awesome at those parties. <laughs> but the more concerned I became about how do I give back to my community? How do I participate? How do I love the people who have helped me how do I not just create an artist model where I am a recipient, but I'm a giver? So I created something called the Grant Love Project. Conveniently, you, you might have heard that my name is Alexandra Grant. <laughs> and um, it doesn't just come from wanting to give grants. It actually means tall in, from my Scottish antecedents. So the Grant Love Project is an artist-owned, that would be me, an operated project that produces and sells original artworks and additions to benefit artist projects and nonprofits. I've become very aware as an artist who makes things, magical things, that about every week I get asked, can you donate a small drawing, print, something, something to our wonderful benefit auction? And it made me aware that what I do is alchemy. I make a magical object, it goes to an auction, it gets sold, and that money then goes to fund everything from arts education to, you know, uh, rethinking public policy on drugs and alcohol. I mean, it's incredible what you get asked for as an artist. So I began to think, wow, there's a real model here that needs to be explored. It's not just artists as entrepreneurs, it's artists having a hand in philanthropy. It's lateral philanthropy. Um, this is what I do in the studio. I make large-scale paintings. You've all, this looks a lot like that, you know. I was like, that looks like my work when you had your schematic for the cars. So I do it without the cars. I do the opera all by myself <laughs> in the studio, collaborating with my many selves. But I make large-scale paintings. And with every painting, I try to do something um, pull from the painting a sculpture. And this is one I did in 2008 that said, a love that should have lasted. It's a, it's a, a, um, a Beatles lyric that I co-opted. And out of that, um, I got this idea that love was the most important word in my practice. That in thinking about how I could use that word to reach out to other communities, I began to revisit Robert Indiana's iconic love symbol. And what's so important to me about this is that he never controlled the rights to this image. So every mug, every statue, everything, he couldn't control that. So I got very interested in um, intellectual property and decided that I would uh, make my love symbol into um, a trademark 
brand for artist philanthropy. So that's what it is. And the reason I have to call it the Grant Love Project is because a corporation claims they own love. And I learned a lot about um, what it means to control words in this day and age, what it means to have um, ownership over this word love. Who can define it? Is it artists? Is it corporations who want to own it? So my first project with the Grant Love symbol was in Watts. It still hasn't been completed. We began it in 2008, and it's called the Love House. And it's, this is a, f a single family house across the street from the Watts Towers. The idea was for the word love to be the bridge between me, a complete foreigner to the Watts community, but who would want to give funds to a family to help engage uh, a, a neighborhood, I hope you get down to see the Watts Towers, that is filled with tourism and that no one who lives there locally benefits from it. There's no way to go to the bathroom or buy a bottle of water. And for the people on that block whose parking options are limited to begin with, 10,000 tourists a month does not make their lives better. So what can an artist do? So I propose this crazy image to a very loving family called the Serrants. And we have been working on, uh, with the architects here, um, Roberto and Arnold, to think of a way to soften the public and private lines on their property to invite, in the same way that Allison did, visitors to come and sit on their property and maybe look at the towers. We funded this fully through the sale of mini, mini Alexandra Grant sculptures, aka love necklaces, um, that at $125, we were able to raise $60,000 for the project, which to me was an incredible thing to think about how you know, an artist can make an object and exchange it for, to create grants. It was an incredible experience. We also made rings. I'm not selling you anything, I swear. Um, but there will be, no, I'm just kidding. Um, what was so interesting about creating a strong brand, and this is the love symbol in Paris with two extraordinary artists, um, Kate and Laura Malevi, who run Rodarte at the Colette store, is that when you create a strong mark, it travels, and it travels really fast. And that is the idea behind the Grant Love Project. We have sold um, our objects at MOCA, LACMA, the Craft and Folk Art Museum, uh, the Gracie store at Santa Monica. But the main place we sell is through our website and through individual partnerships with nonprofits. With 18th Street Art Center, I created a series of prints. These helped uh, not only welcome the community to a collaborative drawing project that took place in Santa Monica and in Paris, but will pay for a catalog of every participant, over 600 people, with their name in it. To me, it's a very important part when you work in communities and with strangers who are invited to these projects to have people be named. And so how do you honor their participation? A project that's going on now is the Grant Love Beach Towels made by artist Devin Suno, uh, based on a pattern of water for, that he found in Pacoima, which is, don't ask me to tell you where it is, but it's sort of far, is it northwest Los Angeles. And now these, again, are a win-win exchange with our supporters. If you buy a Grant Love towel, you will not only get to share in our joy, there's Devin and me celebrating the launch, but all the funds from the towels go to support Hola, the heart of Los Angeles, which you guys have a trip to tomorrow if you choose to go at 2 p.m., which is a wonderful organization in my neighborhood called MacArthur Park. And here are some of the kids in the visual arts project showing us what they've learned to do at Ola. The highest high school graduation rates in the neighborhood come from kids who've attended this visual arts program. So for me as an artist, to make an object that through alchemy can be turned into teaching artists you know, from my community who become the teachers of these younger artists who are learning to express themselves and find the value in their education. Here they are painting the big balls that are floating in MacArthur Park. I hope you get a chance to see that project. We're also supporting Big City Forum, which is um, for the uh, children, adult children in the community, sharing design, architecture ideas about the city run by Leonardo Bravo. The last project I just want to mention quickly is the first one I did outside of Los Angeles, the Union for Contemporary Arts in Omaha. This was a print where I actually learned how to screen print. 
um, that benefited North Omaha. So I'm very interested as an artist, you know, that camping motto, you know, take everything that you brought in and maybe even leave a little bit more. So every community where I get to do an artist project, I also try to create a grant love project. So I just wanna say the final thing about Los Angeles is that we're so full of love for each other that it's a huge defining part of all our artistic practices. And I'm so grateful for the two of you that I got to follow. So welcome to LA. Let's hear it for all three of our artists this morning. Woo!